Um, so uh, just before we start, I want to thank uh, Calliope Arts, um, who have been sponsoring a series of lectures about the female voice in the arts in Florence. And uh, uh, this is the last of their current cycle of lectures that they've been sponsoring. So thanks a lot to Wayne and Margie who are with us tonight from Calliope. And then I will hand the word to Linda Falcone, who most of you know. Linda uh, does a lot of work with the Calliope and is currently also working on the next edition of the Oxano Gaze project in collaboration with us in, in Palmarino, Marino um, up in the hills. Um, and she's been around the scene for 20 years or more. Uh, uh, I was a, a leading light in the Advancing Women's Artists program and does the uh, all kinds of other things, communicative and practical around the art and story here in Florence. So over to you, Linda. Thank you, Simon. It's always a pleasure uh, to come to our British home in Florence, the British Institute of Florence. And uh, I'm really happy to be here tonight, to have the opportunity to uh, present to you the project Artemisia up close, and in particular to introduce our speaker, Elizabeth Wicks, who's the head restorer of the project at Casa Bonarotti, uh, which is conceived and funded by two partners, Calliope Arts. Um, and yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, Artemisia Close is, is conceived and funded by two partners, um, Calliope Arts, which whose mission is to uh, rediscover the contributions of women in various fields. So the field of art, of literature, of science, and more. Um, and the second partner is British philanthropist and art collector, Christian Levitt. So um, it's, it's really, I want to give Liz, Elizabeth, the most of the time, I just want to really quickly introduce you into the world of Artemisia. Um, the Buonarroti painting called the Allegory of Inclination, and you see the detail here, uh, was an early work by Artemisia. She was 20 in her early 20s. So you can imagine this young artist comes from Rome. She was introduced by her father through a letter to the Grand Duchess, Christina de Lorraine. Um, and she came to Florence and established a network uh, with very important figures. Uh, one of course is the Grand Duke Cosimo II and the other is Michelangelo Buonarroti the Younger or Michelangelo the Younger. Uh, Michelangelo the Younger was Michelangelo the Great's Grand nephew, and his mission in life was to create a house museum, a home museum, to tribute his great uncle. And it's actually the first museum in the world tributing an artist. Uh, Artemisia is the first woman to have been accepted, first woman painter to have been accepted into the Academia delle Arti del Disegno, which is Europe's first drawing academy. Um, and that was one year after she produced this work. So this work ended up being very much a business card for Artemisia. And something to consider is it's, in the, it's on the gallery ceiling, a canvas inserted into, the, into a framework on the gallery ceiling. Um, and it has several other companion works created by other up and coming artists that were connected to the Academia del Arte de Diseño. There are a couple of reasons I wanna mention this. One is that these were really contemporary artists. It was the up and coming, this is contemporary art, right? For the 1600s. She obviously painted it nude. It was covered um, not long afterwards. Uh, by another painter called Il Volterano, and Elizabeth will tell us everything we uh, would ever want to know about the veil. It, it obviously wasn't possible to remove the veil, um, but Artemisia did paint the allegory of inclination nude, and she painted it with an idealized self-portrait. 
So this is very important. Inclination was Michelangelo's inclination to create. Um, and the fact that a woman was commissioned to paint this work is, is really significant because women were not considered um, creators of fine art. Um, Michelangelo the Younger paid her three times what she paid any of the other artists and she executed it while she was five months pregnant. So that is a very short introduction to this painting. Um, we're going to learn more about a day in the life of Artemisia and a day in the life of Liz Wicks, Elizabeth Wicks through this project, uh, Artemisia Up Close. And we do invite you to go online, sorry if I can say, to the Calliope Arts website and learn more and see some videos, et cetera, on, on this um, topic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Linda. Is my microphone on? Good. Okay. I will talk to you about a day in the life of Artemisia today. I subtitled this Adventures with Artemisia Up Close because Artemisia is one of the most adventurous Italian Baroque painters I know, male or female. And being with Artemisia it means that you have adventures. So I've had many adventures during, during this project and I'm very thankful to our sponsors for helping me um, conceive and execute it. And one of the really interesting things, this is Artemisia, not today, but yesterday. I took this picture to show you what the project looks like now, because one of the exciting things about this project was that the restoration was entirely, took place entirely um, in the public's view. So we had literally hundreds of people coming while the process was going on. And every Friday, I dedicated the day to speaking with people and answering their questions. And it was a very interesting process. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that at the end of my talk. Right now, she is on view. She's not back up on the ceiling because the painting is going to be the centerpiece of an exhibit that we are holding at Casa Buonarroti starting September 27th and running through January 8th. And I invite you all to visit that where you will not only see this painting, you'll see other works by her, very important documents relating to her life and the circle of artists uh, who worked for Cosimo II. So it's as well as all the documentation about the restoration, which part of which I will show you tonight. But I just wanted to also give you an idea of some of the works that she did during her eight years in Florence. This is the earliest self-portrait of Artemisia that we know about. This is from a private collection. It's in New York and was done in 1613, so just a year after she left Rome. And uh, she's depicted herself as a martyred saint. So I'm not going into the trauma that happened in Rome and the subsequent rape trial and all of that. Most of you probably already know about that. But um, there was a period in which in her art, there was a, a catharsis definitely happening. Um, and she was putting some of that anger into her paintings. Um, and so here we see her turbaned, but with the martyred palm. And this painting is perhaps the one for which she is the most famous, the Judith beheading Holofernes. This is the version in the Pitti Palace. There is another version that was done for Naples and it's at Campo di Monte, Capo di Monte. And it is a gripping scene of retribution. Um, she chooses to portray the exact moment of Holofernes' death. And you can really feel the emotion on the part of the two women, Judith and her maidservant, as Judith 
as they both are struggling to hold down the huge figure of the general and blood is spurting uh, onto Judith's elegant dress and onto the bedclothes. The image is shocking to us today and we're used to violent images. So you can only imagine how people reacted in earlier times. It caused a sensation at the Medici court. Cosimo II loved the painting, but his later descendants, not so much. In fact, Maria Luisa de Medici found the painting so distressing to look at that she had it hung on a dark stair landing at Palazzo Pitti. Later 19th century critics found it impossible that the painting was actually painted by a woman. And Artemisia's artistic fame was forgotten at that point. Finally, this is one of my favorite paintings. Again, it's a, another G Judith scene, but here the head is in a basket and Judith and her maidservant are poised to flee out of Holofernes' tent. I just love the resolute way that the sword is poised on her shoulder, ready for action, and the way that the two figures are looking out of the scene. And plus the carefully depicted details of jewelry and clothing that were so important in Artemisia's art, and which we do not see in the inclination because the painting was nude. So here we come to our painting of the day, the allegory of inclination. And on the um, other part of the screen, you see a view of the gallery room that Linda was talking about. This is the most important room of the five rooms that Michelangelo Buonarroti, the younger, decorated. He composed a very elaborate iconographic scheme. So on the walls, there are 10 large canvases depicting, oops, I haven't gone on here. Why is it not showing? I see it, okay. Um, so here's the gallery room, and we see a one of the side wall paintings, which is Pope Leo X, and Michelangelo is showing him his preparatory drawings, his plans for the Laurentian Library, and then you see a wooden model for the facade of San Lorenzo, which was never executed, Michelangelo's facade. But we do have the wooden model, and it's at Casa Buonarroti, in fact, in the room where I was doing my restoration project. And on the other side of the screen, no, I'm going to go on here, you see the ceiling. There are 15 paintings on the ceiling, and eight of them are attributes. Our painting is the one above the window on the left side. So it was 16 feet in the air for over 400 years of its life until it came off the ceiling. And as Linda said, the figure was painted entirely nude and it is the attribute of inclination or the allegory of inclination. What does that mean? If you look at the vocabulario Toscano of the 17th century, inclination is defined as your God-given gift. And in this case, the God-given talent to create, but you had that God-given talent, you had to bring it out of yourself. So there's that aspect of, um, God-given ability, but also the aspect that you have to overcome difficulty in order to create. Now, certainly that was a very, very uh, pertinent attribute for Michelangelo, whose father tried to beat his artistic genius out of him because he didn't want him to be a, uh, an artist or a sculptor. And he wanted him to be a notary public. But also, obviously, this resonated with Artemisia and if you see the self-portrait, which I showed you before, turned around, you can see that the, the uh, facial features are very similar, I think, and the hair, and there's even the little bump in the nose. So that painting was painted, the self-portrait in 1613. Here we have Artemisia in 1616. I was 
very skeptical about this idea in the beginning, but I've, I've really come around to the fact that I think she is painting herself as the muse and, and um, the personification of inclination. Inclination is holding a compass. And that's also a very interesting aspect that we're gonna go, I won't go into that so much right now, but um, it points to the fact that Artemisia through Michelangelo Buonarroti was introduced to a number of important personalities in Florence in 1616, including Galileo Galilei, who was a friend of Michelangelo Buonarroti the Younger, became a rather improbable friend of Artemisia because she was much younger. She could barely write. She learned to write after she was admitted to the academia because her father was a magnificent painter, but he taught her painting, not um, more academic skills. And this compass is definitely a nod to Galileo. We have found in the deposits of the Science Museum two compasses, nautical compasses in the Galileo Museum, which resemble this compass. So it's, um, it's probable that Artemisia and Galileo corresponded about the compass. They had a correspondence which lasted Galileo's entire life after he was under house arrest and could no longer leave Arcetri, he corresponded with Artemisia and they were men good friends. And um, the other thing I wanna point out here is the star. The star is the North Star. So she is using the North Star and the compass to guide her to pull out her creativity, to follow her inclination, you might say. So here I am on the ceiling um, about to start our project. This was the end of September of last year. And Michelangelo Buonarroti, we're very fortunate at Casa Buonarroti because we have in the archives all of the letters, the preparatory drawings that Michelangelo the Younger made to develop the project of the Seicento rooms, of these five rooms, which as Linda said, was state-of-the-art contemporary painting at the time. And he actually, we realized when we went up on the ceiling, he had hinges installed on the back of the frames so that the paintings, which are painted on canvas and rest on the wooden architectural frames, could, can actually be slid out. They're not fastened. They're just resting on this wooden framework. And we were able to fortunately slide the painting out without too much difficulty. And here I am protecting the painting before we do this process. And then here we have the painting down on the ground. Uh, one thing that was very evident once we got it down was that it was much wider than we'd expected. And that's because the parts that you don't see when you're standing below looking up at the ceiling are actually hidden behind the frame and serve to keep the painting in place. And these were much darker. You can see the uh, strips on the side, a very discolored yellowed varnish. Well, once that varnish was removed, it turned out that there is very little pigment on the sides there where, um, especially when you're looking at the sky. Now the sky, we know from the documents because we know how much Michelangelo Buonarroti the Younger paid for the lapis lazuli. He paid uh, 47 uh, Florentines, Florence for that. Uh, Lapis lazuli was about 45 times more expensive than gold at the time. So it was an extremely precious pigment and he doled it out to the artist. So Artemisia got her allotment of lapis and she didn't wanna use it on parts of the painting that were gonna be hidden behind a frame. So she skimped on that part. And once um, the painting is finished now, you, you will, I will talk about that aspect of it a little bit later. Now I want to show you, this was a raking light photograph taken before conservation. And you see the really terrible state of conservation that the painting was in. 
partially due to a technical flaw in the preparation of these canvases, which were prepared by a color grinder in 1614. And then they were left stretched and prepared with this preparation layer drying out. They were then rolled up and taken to the individual artists when their commissions were assigned. Artemisia's was assigned to her in August of 1615. So um, I think right there, there was already trauma that happened between the preparation layers and the canvas. And then subsequent 400 years lying belly down on the ceiling has done the rest. So this is a problem that is common to all the ceiling paintings, except one that was painted in Rome and not prepared by the color grinder. And um, so it's, it, there, it's a different problem than we see in a lot of Artemisia's paintings. The first steps in any conservation are diagnostics and study. So once we have the painting down, here I am going over it with a digital microscope to assess the condition of the painting and also to figure out exactly where the repaints were. Because as Linda mentioned, this gentleman on the left is uh, Baldassare Franceschini from Volterra and so known as the Volterrano. Strangely enough, another artist from Volterra named Daniele da Volterra was the man who was charged with censoring Michelangelo's Last Judgment. So it seems to be a prerogative of artists from Volterra. Uh, this man was called in by a, an art historian and superintendent who the poet Robert Browning calls the blockhead because when he heard the story, he actually put it in one of his works, Browning, and said, the blockhead bade folk drape the nude and stop the scandal. Because what happened was, Michelangelo Buonarroti the Younger had passed on and left the house to his nephew, another Leonardo Buonarroti. Leonardo Buonarroti, this is about 50 years later, the climate, the moral and political climate in Italy and in, certainly in Florence had changed. And Leonardo Buonarroti had three sisters who were nuns. He had a wife and several children and he seemed very concerned that the morals of his children would be affronted in their decorum by having this naked lady on the ceiling. So he calls in Il Volterrano to cover her up. And on your left, you see a mapping that I did. I actually created a to scale relief map by looking at the painting with ultraviolet light in which you can very clearly see what was done, what was painted by Il Volterrano and what was painted by Artemisia. So I've outlined here the parts that were, oh, 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 yes, it's the one, it's right there. Do you see it? I'm not understanding what people are saying. It's hard to see. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so the parts that are outlined in blue were painted by Il Volterrano, and then the parts in red are shading that was added over Artemisia's flesh tones and over the clouds to set the veils in to the figure. Oops. Okay. Here we have two examples of the diagnostic photography. I had a whole wonderful team of scientists and experts helping me. So these photographs were taken by Ottaviano Caruso and they're called diagnostic photography because they, they help us understand the condition of the painting and its technique. So for instance, the reason that you're seeing a pink background here in this uh, false color infrared photograph is because different blues absorb infrared light differently and they give off wavelengths. So uh, lapis lazuli 
is pink or red in, ultra, in uh, infrared light, whereas azurite or Prussian blue or cobalt are not. So it is a way to do a diagnosis without, actually, without putting your hands on the painting just by taking the photograph. And then the other photograph is ultraviolet fluorescent light. And that shows the surface. So it shows you the yellowed varnish, the very yellowed varnish along the edges. And then also along one of the edges, you see some darker spots. Those date to a restoration that took place in the 1960s. So we had many clues that this was not the first time that the painting came off the ceiling. In fact, I think it is the fourth time, if you count Il Volterrano, because there were two other restoration interventions that took place before this one. Here we have a part of the diagnostic team. This is the uh, Centro Nazionale di Ricerca, so the National Research Center, the Institute for Science and Cultural Patrimony, which we're lucky to have here in Florence. And this is Donata Magrini, and she is doing a test. We did pigment analysis through various instruments, and we also took two micro samples to do two cross sections. But she is uh, using an instrument called FTIR, which is Fourier Transfer Infrared. You don't need to know that. But what she's doing is um, analyzing the varnish here, but next to um, her, the other slide shows you two of the pigments photographed under digital microscope, which we analyzed. And the top one is the lapis lazuli. And you can see that there are darker impurities, which are iron ore. And then also it's very much mixed with white lead. So it, it appears quite light under the microscope. And then from the lips, we have a red ochre. And if you look carefully at that image, you can see some little red specks. Those are the specks of iron oxide red pigment. So we identified all of the pigments that Artemisia used. And this is very important for our field because it rounds out what we know about Artemisia's technique, because we, so far we have, there haven't been a lot of studies done. So this is an important uh, study for that reason as well. And uh, last winter, the painting actually left Casa Buonarroti maybe for the, one of the first times in his life and traveled to the Fortezza, the fortress of the Opificio delle Pietre Dure, which is the state run laboratories here in Florence and inside the fortress. There is also the Institute of National Institute of Optics has a special section which is dedicated to analysis and study of works of art. And it kind of comes full, full circle because the National Institute of Optics main site is the Observatory d'Arcetri, which was of course founded by Galileo. So I thought that was a nice little tie in. We stayed there for two days, the painting and I, while various tests were performed. And um, one of the reasons, obviously, that we were doing all this was an important aspect of this project, which was to read beneath the surface of the painting and see what we could uncover of the original that Artemisia painted. So here we have a reflectograph. There were 32 reflectographs done that went deeper and deeper into the structure of the painting. So going down into the layers. And here you see in the blue arrow, you can see how Artemisia changed the inclination of the head and um, it was actually a little bit less inclined and she turned the head slightly forward. And then I don't know, I hope you can see that there is a second set of eyes that originally the eyes were set lower down. And I, I have a red arrow pointing to that section. What we were hoping to see was what lies beneath the veil. Now the upper veil, which is white 
and more transparent than the very, very heavy layers with thick impasto of the gray veil that is draped over her thighs was penetrated by the reflectography. So you can see her breasts, her very muscular arm through the veil here, but the reflectograph couldn't penetrate the very thick veil. Now, when we started this project, we knew from the outset that we were not going to remove the veils. Why is that? There are two reasons. One is that the veils are historic. They were done by a famous artist. They're part of the history of the painting. The reason that makes much more uh, sense to me is, and I, I really shouldn't be saying this, but I am, is that to remove this very, very thick layer of oil paint, which is only about 50 years later than the original, could pose with the state of the art of conservation as we know it today, could pose a risk to Artemisia's very, very thin gla oil glazes. There are two layers of oil paint, one right on top of the other. The top layer is very, very thick and requires something rather powerful to remove it. And so we certainly would not want to risk any damage to the original. So we knew that from the outset, what we wanted to do was to unveil the painting digitally and to create a digital virtual image of the original. And this we are now doing with the help of all of the diagnostic imagery that has been produced over the last months. So we weren't able to penetrate the veil with reflectography. We then called in Teobaldo Pasquale and he took an X-ray and the X-ray shows what lies under the veil. The X-ray image is kind of confusing because you see everything in an X-ray down to the nails that attach the canvas to the stretcher. And um, here you're seeing the legs sort of through a fog. Those foggy areas are actually the remnants of the Il Volterano veil. And um, you see how she painted that Le leg that you don't see at all, um, that lower leg. And interestingly, I, I'm sure that she was working on her perspective with the idea that this painting was going to be seen from below and it was lying horizontal on a ceiling. Um, so it was very, very important that we were able to obtain this image. And as I said, we are working on creating this digital image full size, which will be unveiled at the show in September. And then we're making all of this information accessible online. So everyone can see all of the documentation and including the virtual unveiled image. So now I'm gonna to talk to you about the conservation. Uh, it started with, after the assessment of what was wrong, um, with the removal of a very thick dirt layer, which was basically cigar smoke that had been deposited on the painting. And that's what I'm doing on the left. And that already um, was revealed a great difference, a lot of subtlety in Artemisia's modeling of her flesh tones, but there was still a very thick varnish layer. And on the right side, I'm removing that varnish, which was a recent natural resin varnish that was probably put on in the 1960s restoration. And here you see um, the red arrow A is the painting uncleaned. The B arrow shows after the removal of the dirt layer and the C arrow is after the thinning of this um, recent varnish, 20th century varnish. And then here we have a ultraviolet photograph that was taken during halfway, about halfway during the cleaning process. So some of the varnish has been removed and we could see more clearly, the dirt layer has been removed. We could see more clearly that those dark areas right above the veil, right by her elbow, those are later additions 
Later editions in ultraviolet light show up as dark. So we're sure that those areas are not Il Volterrano and they're not Artemisia, most definitely, because they're hiding some beautiful, beautiful flesh tones. And so the decision was made to remove those horrible shadings. And I developed, which you can, you can see on the slide on the right, it's just a sort of a gloppy paint by numbers, brown paint that was painted over to further um, hide her flesh tones. And I developed a solvent gel, which was able to remove those areas without damaging any of the original. And I'm just gonna show you a detail of that. And then this is a detail of her feet because I just love her feet. <laughs> it's one of my favorite parts of the painting. She has beautiful feet and, the, and these are marvelous. And all of the subtlety of the shading and the highlights, it's come out now with, that the cleaning is, is done. And you also see the very thick uh, brushwork that she did use in the cloud. So she also did uh, vary her brushwork very much, whether she was doing the sky or the clouds, the background, or the very smooth flesh tones. So once we finished the cleaning, it was time to address the structural problems of the painting. And this was a long process and quite complicated. So I'm just gonna run through it. Um, here, Lorenzo Conti, who is a conservator um, of um, structural conservator of paintings on canvas. He helped me with this project. And here we're attaching strips of polyester canvas to the sides of the painting to put it on a working stretcher. So to start to put it in tension very gradually, just um, using our hands to stretch the painting. And after we did that, we tested a algae, a Japanese algae called Yun Funori, which has been used in Japan for about 350 years on canvas and paper, and in, in the US for probably about 20 years. And here in Italy, it's still fairly experimental. Uh, what it does is it uh, restructures the cellulose, cellulose fibers in the canvas and it relaxes the canvas. You see on the left that there are a lot of cracks because the cracking in the paint actually pulled the canvas. So it was sort of like the surface of the moon. And once we placed the Yunfunori gel on it, it relaxed and it stayed relaxed. So on the right side, I'm brushing the Yun Funori over the back of the original canvas. And then here we are creating a vacuum envelope. We're placing silicon release mylar on top of the painting. And the painting is on a cushioned layer on the table. Here, the painting is face down and we're putting the painting in a vacuum because in the interim, we've put on a, um, on the back, an acrylic resin, a consolidant resin. And we want to have the painting in a, a, in a safe space so that it can't move as the resin is heated. And that's what, what that is. It is a vacuum envelope created with mylar and nylon. And then we have a portable vacuum pump there in the foreground. And then uh, Lorenzo and I on the back are using a temperature controlled precision heat mat to heat in a small areas at a time to a specific temperature, which was 55 degrees Celsius, which was the temperature that we needed to have the acrylic resin, which is a thermoplastic resin flow through the painting and then cool under vacuum. So it went exactly where we wanted it to do where we wanted it to go to re-adhere the paint and preparation layers to the canvas. Once we did that and the painting was consolidated, we attached strips of artificial silk to the edges in order to stretch the painting onto a new stretcher, which was made from a template of the original strainer, which was 
made from old recycled wood. Michelangelo the Younger was trying to save money and, and uh, instructed his carpenter, we know this from a letter, to use some old wood that he had lying around. And, and the, the pieces of wood were really not proper uh, support for the painting at all. And after we finished, this photograph on the left was taken in the same conditions as the photograph on the right. So they're both raking light photographs, but as you can see, there's been quite an improvement. So we were very pleased with this part of the procedure. And um, after that, after varnishing and filling in the small areas of loss, here I am doing pictorial reintegration on a tiny little loss area, um, paint loss above the figure's eye. And here we have the painting before and after conservation. So you can see that I, what I did with the cleaned areas, which, which had very little paint on them on the sides, I toned them down so that you can understand that they're not, they're not really finished, but they're not as disturbing as they were before. Because of course, now the painting is off the ceiling, those areas are not hidden. So we wanted to make them look as presentable as possible. So before I end, I just wanted to discuss with you the fact of Artemisia up close. This was absolutely a very literal title. People got really up close. Um, I had a lot of students come, very happy to have art and conservation and art history students come. This is a class from Florence University of the Arts with their professor. And, um, but I also had some really interesting encounters and I, every Friday I ended up learning something which was, which was great. I mean, I was teaching, but I was also learning. So, um, and people had such an emotional contact with the painting. It was amazing. Once I came in um, after the museum had opened and I found two French people who were kneeling in front of the painting. And it turned out that he was a screenwriter. He's writing a play about Artemisia and he was just overcome with the painting. Another woman named Sarah Mithi, who might be listening tonight, I don't know but she originally flew from San Francisco to come to see the painting in November. And I had COVID and they wouldn't let her see the painting. So she was very upset and she cried. And when I came back to the job, they told me there was a, a strange American woman who cried because she couldn't see the painting. And uh, then she wrote me and she said, I wanna come back again. I'll come back in March. And I said, okay, but just make sure you contact me to be sure that I'm there. And she forgot to contact me, but I was there. And she came with her daughter and she cried again because she was so happy because she had done her uh, master's thesis on Artemisia in 1990 when not many people had heard of Artemisia. So she was, she was fascinated to see it. And then there was um, a strange gentleman. I, I had a, quite a large group on one of my chatty Fridays, I used to call them. Um, who were, I was talking to them, but I saw this gentleman out of the corner of my eye, take a black glove out of his pocket and put it on. And I thought, mm, I mean, these people were pretty close to the painting. So I'm, you know, sort of on the q and I'm, I'm getting ready to jump in. Then he takes something else out of his pocket and it's a little doll. It's a little Artemisia doll. And he's got a sign that says, I never quote a price for my works until they are done. So then he takes a selfie of the doll with the painting. And he explains to me that he doesn't like taking selfies, but he wants to record the fact that he's been there. So he makes these little dolls and he takes them around to places and he takes photographs. And he even had a Michelangelo Buonarroti, the divine Michelangelo Buonarroti doll. So he brought that out and we had two dolls in front of the painting. Thank you. Okay, we'll get some light in and uh, we'll...
let the Zoomers come in. Here they are. Hi, Zoomers. Right, and as always, we'll now do the question and answer phase. So the rules are the same as always. If in the room, if you want to make a comment, ask a question, put your hand up and I'll bring you the microphone so that the people on Zoom can hear. Uh, if you're a Zoomer and want to join us, you have two options. You can either um, unmute yourself and speak to, to us and we'll hear you, uh, or else you can put something in the chat and I'll read it out on your behalf. So does anyone want to get the conversation going over the back now? Liz, can you talk about the emotion? I mean, I would be petrified. <laughs> so when you're putting acrylic on the back of the canvas or something- Did you, did you see my face? <laughs> I mean, I tried to pick the, the pictures that where I'm not looking like, yeah. So it's a scary process. In my, because conservation progresses. And so the moment you're about to do something decisive, do you lose sleep or what, what does it feel like? Well, I would never want to be a brain surgeon. Let's put it that way. I, you know, I, it is, it's, it's a scary process. And what we have to do is keep on top of it and be as prepared and as up to date as we can. Teaching has really helped me stay in, you know, the um, forefront of the field, I think. And uh, yeah. You, it is scary, but you know you don't you don't go in there and start doing something unless you really are sure that it's going to work. Um, we have three questions in the chat already. Uh, Sasha starts out by saying she's really happy to be here, and then she asks, "When does the painting return to the ceiling?" Ah, good question. Well, as far as I know, the painting is going to be down and it will be available to see with someone on appointment. You can go into the museum right now and see the painting as I showed it to you in the second slide. It's in the model room in front of the model of San Lorenzo. And it will be in the exhibit until January 8th, which starts September 27th. After that, it's going to Geneva because there is a show, which I believe is on Orazio Gentileschi, but the uh, curator absolutely wanted this painting. And we said, no, because it has to be in our show. Um, his show starts in November, but it continues, I believe until March. So after our show ends, it's going up to Geneva for a couple of months. And then probably it will eventually go back on the ceiling. Artemisia on tour, that's great. Um, and there's a couple of very technical questions from, from Amalia, what solvents were used to remove dirt and varnish? And from Chris Heider, is the Prussian blue from the 1960 restoration? Okay, well, I'll answer the second question. We did, there is no Prussian blue. We did not find Prussian blue, only lapis lazuli. And what solvents were used? A very mild surfactant and, and a non-ionic detergent in very, very low percentage in distilled water was used to clean off the dirt film. And a mixture of liguerin, which is a very um, apolar solvent, very, very, it's not a solvent, um, but it, it serves to dilute the solvent, which was ethyl alcohol in um, various strengths, but all fairly low strength because the varnish was a recent varnish. I'm, I'm just gonna remind Sarah to put the link up for the Zoomers who might wish to make a donation for participating back. And I've got a question in the room. Thank you, Simon. Um, Elizabeth, thank you very, very much for that wonderful talk. Um, this isn't so much a question, but I've got a few additional points. Um, first, I wanted to thank um, Liz and and Linda for kind of co-creating this project. There was no question in our minds when we were presented with the idea of doing this project that Liz was going to be the restorer of this project. Um, she is a, a master and I would call her in this case, a conductor um, because so many elements needed to be brought together uh, to make this project happen. And she's done a wonderful job in, in conducting that. Thanks also to Casa Buonarotti and their wonderful staff Dr. Checky, if, if you do go to Casablanca Marathi, it's an underlooked and a little bit unloved museum. And I'll come to that in a minute. Um, hopefully you'll meet him. He has been 
a wonderful partner in this project. This is this has been, I think, an uh, an eye opener for him as well in terms of what needs to happen, not just with this painting, with but with the other paintings on the gallery ceiling, which are all in need of additional work too. Um, when I say the museum is a little bit unloved, one of the interesting things about this project is that we've included an element of a facelift for the gallery room, some new lighting, um, some, some work around the entrance. So when you see Casa Buonarotti now, it will have a, a much kind of more welcoming visitor experience for you. And I'm, I'm not trying to convince you to go, but if you do go, I think you'll know um, that, that this has finally had some, some TLC. Well, yeah. Uh, so it's had some TLC that was long overdue, and and largely that's down to our partner um, Christian Levitt, who has a museum of his own, and it was his idea to include in this project some element of of, um, of general uplifting and, and repair for the museum. So, especially the lighting in the gallery. The gallery is a very challenging place to light. Um, so a, a pretty sophisticated team has come in to design a lighting system which will illuminate the ceiling in a much better way. Um, so we'll be able to see Artemisia along with the other 14 yes. paintings on the ceiling much better. They're, they're also improving the, the statuary in the, in, the, uh, in the gallery room as well. Um, I also wanted to mention that um, if you're interested in, in more of what went on at the Opificio, um, next week, I think on the 14th of June, 13th of June, Linda, as, as part of the ongoing work of Calliope, is going to be doing a Restoration Conversations online, live at the Opificio. So she'll be speaking to some of the restorers there who helped with the restoration and the science behind this project. Which, again, if, if you're interested in, in more of the science, if you go to the Calliope Art website, you'll see many videos of, of some of the work that, that Liz has been doing and, and her colleagues. Um, so you can dive a little more deeply into what you've heard today. So I know that wasn't a question, but I just wanted to highlight and, and, and thank you um, for, for all that you've done for, for this project. And, and also to, to just mention that um, we'd love to see you at the museum from the 27th of September, where you'll see not only the Artemisia um, here, but another Artemisia um, uh, which is, is a very fine piece, um, but also a very interesting multimedia presentation, which is being designed and executed now by one of Florence's um, top museum architects. So it's, it's, it's a small but very exciting exhibition, which we hope you'll all attend. There's also a very good catalog, and Liz will contribute to the catalog. So again, if you're interested in this science, you're going to see more of, of, of her contribution in that catalog along with the, um, the contributions of two very fine Artemisia scholars who've written on this piece, her time in Florence, her contribution to Baroque painting in general, um, all of which we hope will bring Artemisia and this painting to a much larger audience um, and a greater awareness, which is what Calliope Arts is, is intended to do. So I'll turn it over back to Liz and thank you all for listening. Yeah, th thanks for that contribution. Yeah. And, uh, uh, thanks a lot for the work that you and Margie are doing with Calliope. And um, we've already started to talk about maybe trying to organize a, a visit for this community to go and see the exhibition in September, October. So we'll try and get that together. Now, I think Jan wanted to say something. Thank you. Very, very interesting. Um, and perhaps I missed this, but to my eye, when you show the body of Artemisia, the right leg, the knee, mm -hmm. and the foot seems odd, seems extendedly long relative to the proportions of the rest of the body. Is that true or am I just misreading? It doesn't look like a normal. It is long and it is perhaps a bit awkward, but that's what I said when I talked about the fact that it's obvious from looking at the entire piece. Right now with the veils on, the legs look rather stumpy <laughs> and you, you can't, I mean, you can't see anything except from the knee down. And then when you see it without the veil, you notice that very long leg. But I do think it's because she was thinking, we're looking at it now up close and it's vertical. She was thinking of a painting 16 feet in the air, horizontal. 
And I think it will fit, it would, if we could take the veil off, it would fit in place once it was on the ceiling. I think it was a, you know, a perspective um, adjustment that she made because the other leg is bent because she's seated on the clouds with that leg. So she has one leg rather fully extended and then another leg kind of in a contrapposto pose. And I think that is, is all, was all done on purpose, absolutely. She did make some changes. She made some other changes. I mentioned the eyes and the head. She also made changes to the arm holding the compass. And she may have changed the foot. We're still discussing that because you don't see that in the x-ray, but you do in one of the reflectographs. So that's an interesting fact. She's an astonishingly beautiful woman. And if it's a self-portrait, congratulations to Artemisia. <laughs> um, more questions or thoughts from the room. Does anyone on Zoom want to unmute and talk to us? Yes, I think Ari is waiting, waving at us. Oh, you? Can I ask about the Japanese the algae? Is it only found in Japan? And how long, how come it has taken so long to be adopted, particularly in Italy? I, that's a good question. I'm not really sure. It was part of the traditional, it was a glue that was used in Japan. It wasn't used for restoration per se. So it was a glue used in Japan to prepare paper, to glue paper, to glue paper and canvas together, and only started to be used in paper restoration rather recently, and then only came to the West fairly recently. Anything else in the chat? No, chat's going quiet. Anything else in the room? Going, going, gone. <laughs> Anyone on Zoom? No, I think we got to the natural end. It's about the time when we normally retire next door for a glass of wine from our current season partners, Frescobaldi. So there'll be decent wine through there. Sorry, Zoomers, you can't come through, but I hope you got a nice glass of wine wherever you are and uh, uh, in, join us in celebrating this uh, wonderful lecture. Thanking Elizabeth Ricks very much indeed for your talk. Thank you. <laughs>